Welcome to the Lyceum Institute Colloquium Series. These colloquia comprising a pre-recorded lecture and live question and answer session invite thinkers of all kinds to challenge us with their insights and understanding. This lecture, the sixth in our series, is titled Mending the Cartesian Rift, Walker Percy on Being Human and is presented by my good friend and faculty fellow of the Lyceum Institute, Dr. Kirk Konzelberger. In this lengthy but informative and challenging exposition and commentary, Dr. Konzelberger leads us through the insights of Walker Percy to those of Charles Sanders Peirce, and thereby demonstrates the fallacy of Cartesian dualism which has dominated our society for centuries. Greetings, members of the Lyceum Institute. My name is Kirk Konzelberger. I'm a faculty fellow of the Lyceum Institute. I lecture in philosophy at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and I also consult professionally after a 30-year career in high tech. If you want to learn more about me, you can find my bio at the Lyceum Institute website. For this colloquium lecture, I've chosen to talk about an essay of Walker Percy titled The Fateful Rift, The San Andreas Fault in the Modern Mind, which is found on page 271 to 291 of a posthumously published collection of works by Percy titled Signposts in a Strange Land. The essay is a lightly edited version of an address Percy delivered as the 18th Annual Jefferson Lecture of the National Endowment for the Humanities in Washington, D.C. on May 3, 1989, precisely a year and a week before Percy died. By the way, you can find the video of Percy delivering the lecture if you type his name into the search box at cspan.org. If you watch the video, you can get a sense of how honored Percy was to be giving the lecture, and also how exhausting it was for him to do it in the midst of his final battle with cancer. The lecture represents perhaps the last major public articulation by Percy of his position on the problem of fundamental anthropology, namely, whether and on what conditions a theory of man is possible. Percy's essay, or address, opens with the statement that, quote, our view of the world, which we get consciously or unconsciously from modern science, is radically incoherent. Now, it's possible that, being aware that this lecture was given under the auspices of the NEH, we might misread or mishear this sentence as referring to the divide between modern science and the humanities. That the teachings of science and the humanities can be difficult to fit together within a coherent view of the world, a claim which seems to many people to be true and something they knew already. But that is not precisely what Percy is saying, as he explains early on in the address. Yes, the teachings of the modern sciences do seem hard to connect with the teachings of the humanities including those teachings of a religious nature. At least to many people, these seem like separate universes of discourse at least, if not separate universes in some other more radical sense as well. Percy mentions a conventional explanation for this divide between the humanities and the, so and the sciences, which is that, well, science deals with facts and truth, whereas the humanities and religion deal mainly with human subjectivity with hopes and feelings and anything else they wish to claim. In other words, runs the conventional explanation, the reason the teachings of science are hard to connect with those of the humanities and religion is that no connection is possible, or needed, or even perhaps desirable. Although if such items as hopes are indeed within the province of the humanities and religion, one might wonder about the value of a hope that rests on nothing true or factual. 
One could, of course, challenge, challenge on behalf of the humanities and religion this supposed sovereignty of science over the entire domain of facts and truth. But one could find ways to argue that philosophy and theology and literature and the fine arts are all bearers of truth each in their way. But this would seem still to leave us with the undoubted chasm between the humanities and sciences. That is, it would seem still to leave us with the question of how one is to recognize any relationship at all between the truth on one side of the chasm and the truth on the other side. What concerns Percy is precisely the chasm itself. It's what he calls the fateful rift, the San Andreas fault in the modern mind. What makes his essay noteworthy, however, is that he does not merely find this rift manifested in or as the chasm between the sciences and the humanities, but he finds it within the sciences themselves, insofar as they attempt to deal with the human being as an object of scientific investigation. That is what his opening statement, in fact, means. That, quote, our view of the world, that is, the world in which the human being is included, which we get consciously or unconsciously from modern science, no mention here of the humanities, is radically incoherent. The incoherence, in other words, as he says on page 272, lies within science itself in the confusion and incoherence of its own theories and models. Accordingly, the challenge Percy means to lay down is a challenge addressed primarily to the practitioners of science. And it is a challenge made not in the name of the defense of the humanities or religion, but in the name of science itself. For as things stand, that is, as things stand under the current regnant principles of scientific practice, a coherent theory of the human being that is even a most basic scientific account of what sort of being the human being is, is not only non-existent, but according to Percy, impossible in principle, given the current regnant principles of scientific practice. It follows that either a coherent theory of man really is impossible, or the current Regnan principles of scientific practice themselves need to undergo some kind of development. Which leads to the second noteworthy thing about this essay of Percy, in that he argues that this needed development of scientific principles is possible, particularly in light of the insights and discoveries of Charles Sanders Peirce, which point the way toward an enlarged scientific paradigm that holds the promise of mending the fateful rift and of making possible, quote, a new and more coherent anthropology, that is, a theory of man. And what I want to do in the remainder of this lecture of mine is to work through Percy's argument in some detail, offering along the way some background on the two protagonists of the essay, namely Descartes, in whose thinking the fateful rift emerged in a seminal way, and Charles Sanders Peirce, the scientist, logician, philosopher, whose thinking undermines the thought of Descartes and points the way toward a new paradigm for science. Finally, I want to offer a bit of critical discussion and a reflection or two of my own on this important essay of Walker Percy. So, on then to the argument. The incoherence within modern science, when it deals with the human being, the, in, the confusion and incoherence of science's own theories and models is, Percy argues, the gap between two kinds of theory, two kinds of model, that both seem necessary but at the same time unrelated and indeed unrelatable. That is, the two kinds of theory do not cohere or stick together. And under the principles currently in charge in scientific practice, Percy claims, there is no conceivable way for them to do so. The first kind of theory deals with items that are visible, at least with the help of instruments, material entities or elements, and the quantifiable energy transactions that occur between them. 
Under this kind of theory, the human being is an organism, understood in modern terms as a self-maintaining and self-replicating system of matter and energy that operates under the same laws of chemistry and physics that apply to non-organisms. That is, central to this kind of theory is the observable continuity of physical laws across the skin or membrane that separates the organism's internal milieu from the environment outside and also regulates the transactions occurring between organism and environment. Now, taken by itself, this kind of theory is perfectly coherent. The study of human physiology and the mechanical, chemical, and electrical processes occurring within the human organism and between it and the environment is just as coherent as the study of the physiology of amphibians, or for that matter, the study of inorganic processes occurring outside the membrane of any organism. The same principles and laws of physics and chemistry are in play. As an application of this kind of theory in the study of animal and human behavior, behavioristic psychology treats cognition itself and cognition-dependent behavior from the outset as reducible to or identical with particular mechanisms of energy exchange between material, for example, neural elements that explain behavioral responses to environmental stimuli. This kind of psychology, which in effect eliminates the psychological or mental as a real category distinct from matter-energy transactions, obviously inherits the very same theoretical coherency as the study of energy transactions in any other material domain. But there is clearly a rift between this kind of theory and, say, the theories of personality of Freud or Jung, as there is a rift between a behavioristic theory of animal communication and, say, linguistics as the formal study of the grammar of characteristically human symbolical utterances. And so we come to the second kind of theory of the human being, or about the human being, a kind of theory that deals with items that are in principle invisible, non-measurable objects or entities or states, items that are said to pertain to mind or thought or the mental, to the logical or the purely formal, or to the cultural phenomena that are founded upon such invisible, non-measurable objects or states. And so we have not only physical anthropology, but cultural anthropology. We have purely formal theories of mathematics and logic and linguistics, as well as the various psychoanalytic theories of personality that try to understand the tensions and struggles internally affecting the consciousness of human beings. The objects of these human or formal sciences are all, in one way or another, dependent for the being they have on the objectifying life of the human mind, on human cognitive acts. Social roles, laws, rituals, archetypes, mathematical objects, logical relations, etc., are all examples of objects that are either partly or entirely cognition-dependent entities, in themselves, in principle, invisible and unmeasurable. These two kinds of theory, then, may be characterized, for lack of better terms at least, as theories of, quote, physical entities and theories of, quote, mental or mind-dependent entities. This gap between the two kinds of theory should ring all sorts of bells with any student of the history of philosophy. To quote Percy on page 274, in fact, in speaking of the, quote, mental and the, quote, physical, of the psyche and the brain, and with however much hope and sophistication we wish to phrase it, are we not admitting that we are still hung up on the horns of the ancient dualism of Descartes, however much we wish to believe we had gotten past it. Descartes, if you recall, divided all reality between the res cogitans, the mind, and the res extensa, matter. God alone, literally, knew what one had to do with the other. To put it bluntly, as Percy says, 
it is impossible to see how, even in principle, mind can be connected up with matter. This gap is, as he puts it, incoherent and intractable, at least from the present posture of natural science. That is to say, no amount of effort by, quote, brain scientists and, quote, mind scientists can even narrow the gap. It is not like tunneling under a river from both sides and meeting in the middle. It is more like ships passing in the night. Now, of course, <clears throat> it is hardly the case that scientific practitioners universally admit the, to this state of affairs. In natural science, says Percy, we, we can see his lifelong affinity and allegiance to natural science when he says, in natural science, we do not like to admit that we are still split by a 300-year-old dualism. Well, indeed not. If there is anything a scientist loves, it is continuity. If there is anything a scientist hates, it is discontinuity. When this monumental discontinuity comes into view, several types of evasion are often practiced. One is simply the habit of never, not ever looking straight at the discontinuity, but rather deftly hopping back and forth across it, as if it were nothing more than a crack in the grass rather than the San Andreas fault in the modern mind simply interleaving mind sentences with brain sentences, as if the relation or the correspondence between the two sorts of referent were too obvious to need explaining. When this does not suffice, and it seems obligatory to acknowledge the existence of the discontinuity, textbooks of the sort that might be used in a course like the Psych 101 course that Percy uses as an example, will dismiss it, in a sentence or two, like Reagan dismissing the, natural, the national debt. Remember, this was 1989. What this ease demonstrates is that the fateful rift has been with us so long that we have learned to live with it, like your family learns to live with your weird uncle. Yes, weird Uncle Louie. He's always around, he's always with us, but we don't really talk about Uncle Louie. Another type of evasion is the easiest and obvious sounding analogy, such as that brain is to mind as hardware is to software. In this case, to speak in logical terms, the material equivalence between, on the one hand, the transformational patterns of machine outputs in relation to machine inputs as grasped by a mind and on the other hand, actual logical truth-functional relationships as grasped by that same mind, allows that mind to superimpose the two. That is, to superimpose the conception of its own living cognitive logical operations upon their mechanical simulacrum. A superposition expressed by the very phrase, digital logic. By means of this superposition, one is enabled comfortably to think on both sides of the rift at once, as it were, and in that way, again, casually to disguise it. A third kind of evasion is the flat reductionist non sequitur. Thus, Neil R. Carlson, in Physiology of Behavior, quoted by Percy on page 275, What can a physiological psychologist say about human self-awareness? We know that it is altered by changes in the structure or chemistry of the brain. We conclude that consciousness is a physiological function, just like behavior. To which Percy responds somewhat tartly, to say that mind is a property or function of the organization of the brain is like saying that Raphael's Orleans Madonna is a property of paint and color. That is, Simply to point out that something about self-awareness changes when brain chemistry changes is no more illuminating than pointing out that something about the Orléans Madonna would be different if the paint colors were different. Nobody doubts that. The discontinuity, the incoherence of models, 
lies in the fact that the principles and categories underlying the scientific grasp of material properties and patterns of energy transaction offers no purchase at all on what it means for a human being to engage in peculiarly human and publicly observable behavior, such as, for example, being moved to devotion on seeing Raphael's painting. Nor, for that matter, do they offer any purchase upon what it means for human beings to utter sentences, including scientific sentences, that tell the truth about things, or lie, or don't make any sense at all. You can investigate formally the grammar and semantics of scientific and other kinds of human utterances, of course, just as you can lay out a formal theory of geometry and use it to discuss the visual design of a work of art. But such theories of formal relationships do not address the question of what meaningful linguistic utterances or artistic representations are as human and natural phenomena, which they clearly are. If you could begin to answer that question, you would have the beginnings of an actual anthropology, an actual theory of man. For in language, as a natural phenomenon, and not merely as a formal structure, Percy carefully qualifies, the, quote, mental and the, quote, physical are found, distinct and yet somehow wedded up in every act of linguistic communication between these curious beings we call human, just as the, quote, mental and the, quote, physical are seemingly somehow wedded up in the human being itself. In Percy's view, then, the incoherence of the theories and models of modern science, as they attempt to deal with the human being, mirrors the fateful rift between mind and matter introduced into human nature by Descartes 350 years ago. Before going any further, I think it will be helpful to take a brief look at Descartes and the argument by which he establishes mind and matter as two independent substances, a.k.a. Cartesian dualism. The argument I have in mind is found in the sixth and final meditation of Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy, where it functions as a lemma for the proof of the existence of the material world, as well as a probable, if not strictly demonstrable, proof of personal immortality. It is quite a short argument, but its premises and their vocabulary will require some commentary. The argument begins with the claim... I know that all the things that I clearly and distinctly understand can be made by God, that is, can actually exist outside of my mind, such as I understand them. Unquote. Now, to one who is not the kind of rationalist that Descartes is, that premise might sound a bit odd, so let's spend a little time working it over. First, whenever Descartes says, I know, he means, I know beyond any capacity for doubt. When it comes to knowing anything that deserves to be called true knowledge, Descartes is an infallibilist. Where does the indubitability of true knowledge come from? Its source is the clarity and distinctness of that which presents itself to his mind. Now, in this case, what Descartes is saying that he knows is something he clearly and distinctly understands about all the particular things he conceives clearly and distinctly, namely, their metaphysical possibility. That is, he knows that they can be made by God such as he understands them. It is important to understand that whether God makes these things or not, the conceptions of them are conceptions that Descartes already knows to be true on account of the clarity and distinctness of the conceptions themselves, which are not derived from sense experience, but originate from reason alone. 
This premise is thus a rationalist premise in the sense that it attributes to the mind a knowledge of things that is a priori, that is, prior to or independent of sense experience. Descartes makes it abundantly clear that he thinks that no clear and distinct idea, that is, none of the conceptions that constitute true knowledge, can possibly have its origin in sense experience. These all-important qualities of clarity and distinctness belong to ideas of pure reason, which it draws forth or constructs from its own resources, or which are impressed on it by God, or perhaps by some other non-material being. Now, the clear and distinct conceptions Descartes is considering in this particular context are clear and distinct conceptions of material things, that is, spatially extended things. And the problem at hand in Meditation 6 is proving that such things actually exist outside his mind. Here at the start of Meditation 6, Descartes still does not know that any material thing exists, not even his own body. Nevertheless, he is fully informed on the nature of material substance. How? Because pure mathematics is, he believes, independent of sense experience. And at least as far as can be known by us, actual material substance has only that nature that can be understood through pure mathematics. Pure mathematics which is, as it were, a world apart, a world of ideas, clear and distinct, posited and manipulated by reason alone, based on the pure idea of extension. No sensory images, or ideas of sensation, as he calls them, can ground true knowledge of the nature of bodies, or even provide a clear warrant for their existence outside of the mind. Read, for instance, Descartes' reflection on the piece of wax that he melts in the fire in the second meditation. What is clear and distinct and intelligible and certain about the piece of wax in fact, the only clear and distinct conception of the wax is the conception of a thing extended, flexible, and mutable. In other words, a thing with three spatial dimensions and the mathematical continuum of the movement of its parts in space. In short, what is clearly and distinctly known of the wax, as Descartes himself says, is all that which belongs to extended being as it is able to become the object of pure mathematics. And the whole of that kind of conception, clear and distinct as it is, comes from the natural light of reason, period. It is possessed by the mind a priori and has no origin in sense experience. Now, listen again to Descartes' initial premise. I know that all the things that I clearly and distinctly understand can be made by God such as I understand them. We can now grasp the meaning of this premise. For Descartes, the very clarity and distinctness of his mathematical conceptions is itself a proof of metaphysical possibility. A proof, in other words, that material things answering to those conceptions can exist and, if they do, the science of them that he develops through the pure mathematics of extension is guaranteed to be correct. Such was Descartes' dream of an a priori mathematical physics. And more could be said about that subject, but what concerns us at the moment is Descartes' very interesting application of this same premise to prove that mind and body that is, supposing the latter to exist, are two independent substances. Let's listen to the premise one last time. I know that all the things that I clearly and distinctly understand can be made by God such as I understand them. For this reason, he goes on, my ability clearly and distinctly to understand one thing without another suffices to make me certain 
that the one thing is different from the other, since they can be separated from each other, at least by God. The question as to the sort of power that might effect such a separation is not relevant to their being thought to be different. So, the rationalist premise about clear and distinct conceptions guaranteeing that things can exist in exactly the way they are being conceived is here taken by Descartes to mean that when the clear and distinct conceptions of two things are distinguished by dissociation, that is, each is understandable without any reference to the other, then the two things being conceived, supposing them both to exist, are in reality different in just the way that their conceptions are. That is, even if the two things exist in some way together, they coexist as two utterly different things that can be separated from each other, at least by God, with no effect on each thing being exactly what it is. As Descartes continues, For this reason, from the fact that I know that I exist, and that at the same time I judge that obviously nothing else belongs to my nature or essence except that I am a thinking thing, I rightly conclude that my essence consists entirely in my being a thinking thing. And although perhaps, or rather, as I shall soon say, assuredly, I have a body that is very closely joined to me, nevertheless, because on the one hand, I have a clear and distinct idea of myself insofar as I am merely a thinking thing and not an extended thing, and because on the other hand, I have a distinct idea of a body insofar as it is merely an extended thing and not a thinking thing, it is certain that I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it." Unquote. Well, we have a couple of conclusions here. The first is his firm conclusion that his own essence consists entirely in his being a thinking thing, a res cogitans. He had hedged on this earlier in the meditations when he allowed that he might be a thinking thing and perhaps something else as well. But now, the rationalism of clear and distinct ideas allows him finally to purge the perhaps something else from his conception of what he is, allowing him to conclude with certainty that his essence is thought alone. As he put it back in the second meditation, thought alone is inseparable or indissociable from what I am. That very indissociability of thought from his I, he now takes to be enough to show that his own essence consists in thought alone. A parallel consideration applies to the clear and distinct conception of body, which is the conception of pure extension and whatever follows upon extension as an object of pure mathematics. This is the conception of body purged of all that is not clear and distinct. Consequently, the essence of material things is whatever can be the object of pure mathematics, and that alone. The upshot for Descartes is that these two, thought and extension, when they are clearly and distinctly conceived, are conceived in utter dissociation from each other. This is enough for him to conclude that, supposing his own body to exist, he is, quote, really distinct from his body and can exist without it. Thus does Descartes fulfill, or at least make a stab at fulfilling, his promissory note to the theology faculty in Paris to provide an ironclad argument for personal immortality but we don't need to pursue that topic further in this lecture either. We can see in this argument establishing the dualism of mind and body, not only the rationalism of Descartes, but the underlying nominalism as well. If there is a distinction between mind and body, then they are distinct as one individual differs from another individual, 
and the categorical difference of their essences, thought on the one hand and extension on the other, makes them seemingly not only unrelated but unrelatable. So let, let's consider a couple of consequences of all this, whose impact is awfully hard to overstate. The first, which is now staring us in the face, is, of course, the impact of this fateful rift on the theory of what the human being is. The human being is seemingly not one being, but two, a mental substance somehow joined and somehow interacting with an extended bodily mechanism. Moreover, the clarity and distinctness that is to say, the truth of the conception of each of the two substances hinges on the completeness of the dissociation of that conception from the conception of the other substance, a dissociation which is taken to mirror the real independence of the two substances as they exist independently of his thinking. Now, not everybody at the time was happy with this contribution of Descartes to fundamental anthropology. Descartes, at times, seems less than happy with it himself, especially when he has to answer objections to it. Descartes admits already at the end of Meditation 6 that the unity of the human being as one being appears to be a fact of experience, despite being inexplicable under his theory. For example, he admits that such realities as pain, hunger, and thirst do not appear merely to be deficient conditions of the mechanism of his body that his mind at the time merely observes as belonging to some other thing, the way a sailor might observe something amiss with his ship, but that he himself feels these things as his pain, his hunger, etc., Descartes, then, is still, in this sense, traditional. He denies, or at least he tries to deny, that the unity of mind and body is merely an operational unity like that of the sailor and the ship. He even tosses around language about the human composite and the commingling of mind and body, though it is not clear what these phrases can possibly mean for him what it could mean for the immaterial substance of the mind self to be commingled or joined to a mechanical unity of extended parts in such a way as to bring about one single man. In the end, Descartes' own honesty about the fact of a unity that is evidently not merely operational led him to say simply that the unity of the human being, that is, the unity of mind and body, is as obscure as it is factual. It is something that God brings about, but we know neither why he does so, nor how to conceive this unity clearly and distinctly. I am reminded of the dry remark of Charles Peirce, of whom more very shortly, that while scholasticism had its mysteries of faith, it at least undertook to explain all created things. But there are many facts says Peirce, which Cartesianism not only does not explain, but renders absolutely inexplicable, unless to say that God makes them so is to be regarded as an explanation. That's from his paper, Some Consequences of Four Incapacities. On the other hand, despite this great difficulty, the great benefit, if you like, of this dualism for Descartes and for those of like mind was and is that, in the neat phrase of James Collins, it enables and justifies a great simplification. Namely, it liberates one to pursue a purely mechanistic theory of nature alongside a purely spiritualistic philosophy of mind. Descartes said in his book Principles of Philosophy, I do not accept or desire any other principle in physics than in geometry or abstract mathematics, because all the phenomena of nature may be explained by their means and sure demonstrations given of them. Unquote. 
That is, Descartes is convinced that as far as the operative principles of nature are concerned, principles by virtue of which nature behaves as nature behaves, there is no more in the natural world than is representable in the world of the mathematical explanation or model. Nature is nothing more than matter in motion, and motion is nothing more than displacement in space. Descartes professed to find Aristotle's definition of motion or change as the actualization of a potentiality insofar as it is in potentiality, meaningless. For Descartes, material existence is purely and simply actual, with a positivity as purely and simply positive as the mind's positing of a mathematical object. Material existence is either actual or it is nothing, just as a mathematical object is either an object posited by mathematical imagination or it is nothing. I will return to this point at the very end of my lecture. As for the human mind spirit, the res cogitans, it is, in the splendor of its intellectual autonomy, pretty good at taking care of itself. The business of the immaterial ego is with its immaterial ideas, especially including the immaterial ideas of mathematical objects, which it draws forth from its own resources, which it clearly and distinctly intuits and manipulates by the pure light of reason. This brings us to the second important consequence of the dualistic move, which concerns the theory of knowledge. To the extent that what we call the knowledge of reality would hinge upon a real connection between the mind and the world that it understands, such a connection is rendered inconceivable by the very same dissociation that separates Descartes' mind from his body and proves, or at least suggests, his personal immortality. To even think in terms of, in the happy phrase of Kempel, a nexus between mind and world, would require a mediating conception of some sort, some positive conception of continuity between the, quote, mental and the, quote, physical, which would, on Cartesian terms, begin to muddy and therefore falsify the clear and distinct conceptions of them both. Descartes, of course, tries to do away with the need for a problematic nexus between mind and world. For Descartes, and the entire modern philosophical mainstream in his wake, what the mind directly knows is in every instance not an extramental thing, but an idea. That is, what the mind directly knows is, in every case, something that is itself mental, something that the mind itself brings forth or conceives. It was left to David Hume to show that any resemblance or correspondence between ideas and the supposed world of things outside the mind is a pure supposition for which no rational ground can ever be found. It was left to Immanuel Kant, in Hume's wake, to posit the extramental world as unknowable in itself. What the mind knows is and can only be what the mind itself makes. And what it makes are objects which it synthesizes by the application of a priori structuring principles to an indeterminate sensible manifold, in such a way that the extramental thing remains unknowable in itself, hidden forever behind the veil of appearances. Thus, in the history of idealism stemming from Descartes, the mind and its knowledge are sundered from the world it would wish to know. For to know the world would imply some kind of meeting point, some kind of proportion, some apprehensible connection between idea and thing. In other words, some kind of connection between what, for Descartes, were utterly dissociated conceptions. Well, what about science in the wake of Descartes? On that front, the investigation of the material cosmos, Descartes and Galileo, indeed, inaugurated something new, 
though not exactly the new thing they thought themselves to be inaugurating. Both thought themselves to be establishing a more correct philosophy of nature. In fact, as Yves Simon and others have argued, what they were doing was rather establishing a non-philosophical method of investigation of natural phenomena based on mathematical modeling. As Descartes foresaw with great perspicacity, the mathematization of nature would greatly accelerate the ability to predict and exercise control over natural phenomena. And indeed, the science of material phenomena, being a non-philosophical method of investigation, has been able to progress by leaps and bounds, while taking hardly any notice of the anthropological and epistemological quandaries of modern philosophers. Except that, in the end, the human being, the human being in toto, that is, including the human ability to think and understand, is an object of scientific interest. Well, let's return now to Walker Percy's address and the contributions of Charles Sanders Peirce to a possible mending of the Cartesian rift. For Walker Percy, the figure of Charles Peirce stands out for several reasons. First, Charles Peirce stands out because he alone of the moderns got out of the box of early modern assumptions and approaches by undertaking a serious reading of the history of philosophy, including the Latin scholastics. John Dealey liked to say that the most successful thing Descartes ever said had nothing to do with cogito ergo sum, but was rather his dismissal of scholastic philosophy in the Discourse on Method as serving mainly to, quote, provide the means of speaking plausibly about all things and of making oneself admired by the less learned, unquote. While Descartes seemed to imply that it was good to have read those things, quote, in order to know their true worth and to guard against being deceived by them, unquote, succeeding generations of modern thinkers seem to take this rather as a license to ignore them altogether, except for Charles Peirce. Through the scholastics, Peirce came more fully to understand the alternative between modern nominalism and scholastic realism, as he called it. The realism that acknowledges not only the reality of individual things, but real relations that engender and sustain them, the real laws or active general principles that govern them, and real possibilities, that is, definite potentialities that are neither actualities nor mere figments. In other words, the notion of potentiality that Descartes had no use for. This study of the scholastics was an indispensable condition of Peirce turning out to be, as Dealey also put it, the last of the moderns and the first of the postmoderns. Besides learning from the scholastics, as important for Walker Percy is that Peirce salvaged their realism from the, quote, medieval language that is now all but incomprehensible to us, recasting it in terms familiar to the scientists and laymen of today. A second reason Peirce stands out for Percy is that Charles Peirce, while contributing in seminal ways to logic and mathematics, as Descartes also did, at the same time rejected the rationalism of Descartes. While Descartes denied the dependence of true knowledge on sense experience, Peirce was the kind of man of science for whom, as for Aristotle, experience grounds anything we can call knowledge. In his essay, Philosophy and the Conduct of Life, Peirce expresses his appreciation for Aristotle as, quote, an Asclepiades, as belonging to a line every man of whom, since the heroic, heroic age, had as a child received a finished training in the dissecting room. Aristotle was, quote, a thorough-paced scientific man, such as we see nowadays, except for this, that he ranged over all knowledge. As a veteran of the dissecting room himself, Walker Percy, the physician and once aspiring pathologist, had a natural affinity with such men of science. But if it is experience that teaches us, if that reality, independent of our thought, discloses itself and becomes our teacher through experience, then there is indeed a nexus between mind and world. 
And this brings us to the third feature of Peirce's thought that stands out for Walker Percy, namely Peirce's semiotics. His discovery, or rediscovery, of the intersection of mind and world in the being and action of the sign. Peirce, as Percy reads him, focuses attention on the one natural phenomenon in which mind and matter observably intersect, namely linguistic communication. As Percy puts it on page 279, language is both words and meanings. It is impossible to imagine language without both. For though a, sp a spoken word is a sound, say the sound cat, a vibration of a material medium striking a material eardrum and stimulating the firing of material neurons, and though its referent may be a very material cat, the relation in which word and object are linked together as sign and referent, the relation we call signification, is not a material or mechanical interaction or linkage even if many such material interactions must be presupposed as a foundation or matrix on the basis of which actual signification can take place. Following Peirce, says Percy, we must recognize that there are not just one, but two kinds of natural events in the world, two kinds of natural events that have different parameters and variables, dyadic events and triadic events. Dyadic events are the familiar subject matter of the physical and biological sciences, the efficient linkages or energy transactions between material items, A interacting with B, A, B, C, and D interacting with each other. It does not matter how many such items there are or how complex the pattern of their interactions. Whether they are balls on a billiards table or stars in a galaxy or neurons in a brain, the behavior of the system as a whole is understandable as a sequence or complexus of dyadic or pairwise interactions. No matter how complex the pattern of interactions, if we acknowledge the reality of only one kind of natural event, namely dyadic energy exchanges, then there is only one sort of thing going on in even the most complex interactions, including in animal behavior interpreted, that is, behavioristically. However, says Percy, interpreting Peirce, there is another kind of natural event, quite as real, quite as natural a phenomenon, quite as observable, which cannot be understood as a complexus of dyads, but is structurally distinct, inasmuch as it involves an irreducibly triadic relationship. This event is the linguistic or language event, the simplest example of which, and it is anything but simple, says Percy, is the event of naming, as when the young child first learns that things have names. When that happens for a young child, or for Helen Keller in that miraculous moment in the pump house with Anne Sullivan, the sound cat ceases to be merely an indexical signal eliciting an animal response to go get cat or look for cat or watch out for cat, but rather the sound cat becomes a symbol for the cat itself, for that thing as a thing. This event, the act of naming, or the responding to a name as a name, that is, as a symbol, is a piece of behavior true enough, says Percy, but any behavioristic reading of it as a sequence of dyads will miss the essence of it. The copula is, as in that is a cat, represents, quote, the tiny triadic lever that moves the entire world into the reach of our particular species. For anything can be and is named, even that which we do not know. We have a name for the gaps in our knowledge. We call them gaps. The triadic creature, that is, the symbol-mongering creature in whose symbolizing activity the triadic relation is realized, does not merely live in an environment as other organisms do, but inhabits a world, 
a world which it grasps as a totality, and of which totality, needless to say, the triadic creature endeavors to give an account through symbols, whether it be in terms of cosmological myths, scientific theories, philosophical teachings, theological doctrines, or what have you. The consciously employed symbol, beginning with the name, mediates the specifically human grasp of the world and things. At this point, I think it will help to get just a bit more purchase on the triadicity of this relation of signification as irreducible to a complexus of dyads. This irreducibility claim of Peirce has an importance that can hardly be exaggerated, and it is the claim that Peirce, it's the claim of Peirce that Walker Percy most latches onto. It is a claim that is rooted in fundamental categories of being. As some of my listeners may know, Peirce, early in his thinking, in 1867 to be exact, posited a new list of fundamental categories. And in some sense, the remainder of his life till 1914, when he died, can be understood as an exploration of the landscape opened up to him and to all of us by that new list of categories. These categories are fewer in number but more comprehensive than the famous categories of Aristotle, inasmuch as Aristotle's categories of substance, quality, quantity, etc. are intended as categories of ens naturae, the being natural things have, that is, the being that exists and is what it is independently of the cognition of finite knowers. Though there is, importantly, a whole in Aristotle's scheme, or I suppose one could call it a poor, and that poor is the category of relation. For there is a way in which relation is a natural category of its own, and a way in which relation spills over and invades all the other categories. There's a long story there that I'm not going to tell here, but when I quickly sketch Peirce's new list of categories, in which, as he puts it, he gives to being the broadest possible sense, to include ideas as well as things, and ideas that we fancy we have, just as much as ideas that we do have, I think you will see the primordiality of relation in evidence across this new list of categories. There are only three, firstness, secondness, and thirdness. Firstness is the mode of being of that which is such as it is, positively and without reference to anything else. Any quality in itself, the scarlet of royal liveries, the quality of a stage play one has seen and before one has begun to analyze. As you can see, the notion of quality here does not imply anything about the simplicity or complexity of internal structure of that which bears the quality. <clears throat> it only implies that the quality is such positively and without reference to anything else. As soon as you begin to take a thing apart and relate part to part, or consider it in relation to its causes, or whatever, you cease to attend to that thing as a first, or according to the mode of firstness. Secondness is the mode of being of that which is such as it is with respect to a second, but regardless of any third. Brute interaction. Things knocking up against each other and changing each other's states of motion or energy states. Complexes of such interacting elements a sudden tap on your shoulder, the mutual resistance of arm and dumbbell during a workout. In short, dyadic events as dyadic events. Thirdness is the mode of being of that which is such as it is in bringing a second and third into relation with each other. Thirdness is the category of representation, mediation, and the sign. In the context of Walker Percy's naming example, the sound cat brings object and interpreter into relation with each other, specifying the awareness of the interpreter, say, Helen Keller, to be an awareness of something that the symbol itself is not, namely a feline creature. The sound cat 
is not the cat. It names the cat. For the human, it is a sign of a symbolic type. Thanks to a habit that has taken root in the human interpreter, that symbol specifies the awareness of the human knower to be an awareness of the cat, or of cats as a class, rather than of a dog, or a tree outside the window, or a patch of sunlight on the carpet. For the human child that has crossed the linguistic threshold, or for the post-pump house Helen Keller, this sound cat is a word, that is, a symbol denoting a certain kind of being as a certain kind of being. This kind of relational structure is irreducible to a sequence or complexus of dyads. One can, of course, speak of a kind of mediation by dyadic interaction, as when physical momentum is mediated from billiard ball A to billiard ball C via a billiard ball B. This is mediation in a weaker or less proper sense that is reducible to two dyadic interaction events of A with B and B with C. And of course, we could just as well be speaking of neurons as of billiard balls. The mediation of the symbol, however, is a mediation in a stronger sense. The interpreter does not come merely to possess a copy of the object or something that the object also has or had but is rather brought into relation with the object itself through the indirection of the symbol. It is by means of the articulations of symbols and the mental signs that underlie those articulations, namely intellectual concepts, that communities of human interpreters endeavor to understand objects themselves and the laws that govern them, and make assertions, assertions that may be true or false, concerning the objects themselves. At this point, we might begin to be able to appreciate that what we call language is more than just a particular modality of animal communication. All sorts of animals communicate. Animals make sounds, perform physical displays, deposit pheromones, etc., as signals to other animals of the same species or of different species, in order to attract, scare off, indicate the direction of a food source, summon offspring, and so forth. Such signaling behaviors are related to the interests of animals of those species, and are bounded by the species-specific nature of an animal's umwelt. Bounded, that is, by an animal cognition that is restricted to those segments of the physical environment that matter for the surviving and thriving of that kind of animal. But humans make sounds, as well as marks on paper and such, <clears throat> in order to form sentences that tell the truth about things, or try to. What things? In principle, all things. For the human animal does not live merely in an umwelt, but in a welt, a world grasped as the totality of what is, in any sense, whatever. Language is both words and meanings. <clears throat> the meaning always includes, in one way or another, the idea of reality, of being as that which is what it is, which may be relatively unknown to us, but is able to be investigated and understood, or being as that which we took to exist but turned out not to, like the celestial spheres of Ptolemy or the planet Vulcan, or being as that which does not exist but might be brought into existence by us, such as a new civic order for a new society, or new methods of propulsion for moving vehicles, or being as that which we can only dream of, future plans rendered impossible, the life of a child never born, or worlds such as Middle Earth that for all their richness never existed and never will. Language, therefore, implies a particular capacity for modeling the world as such, including orders and relationships that do not or perhaps even cannot exist. And as it happens, for modeling one's own self as a happy or unhappy denizen of the world that does exist. As Percy explores much more deeply in his work Lost in the Cosmos, the last self-help book, 
the triadic creature that discovers itself at the dead center of its world of experience, immediately faces two interrelated problems. First, the problem of placing itself in that world so as to understand itself. And second, the problem of figuring out how to comport itself, what to do with itself in that world, particularly in relation to the others, to other triadic creatures, that is, other persons. For this reason, the triadic symbol-mongering creature has the possibility of being happy or unhappy. Animals, including humans, have the capacity of being content or not content when their needs and drives are for the moment satisfied. But animals that are not human do not have the possibility of being happy or unhappy. That is because the creature that can be happy or unhappy is the creature that exists on a normative axis of which it is itself aware. And the creature that exists on a normative axis of which it is itself aware is precisely the consciously sign-using creature. Language is not mere animal communication. Language is the use of signs by creatures who know they are using signs. That is, it is the use of signs by creatures who are formally aware of the relation of signification. Other animals, as Jacques Maritain put it, use signs, but they do not know that there are signs. When a sign user is a conscious sign user, a sign user who knows that it uses signs, such a sign user can use signs to tell the truth or lie. The actions of triadic creatures exist on the same normative axis. When the conscious sign user performs an action, a deed, this is another kind of symbol, governed or determined by the triadic sign user's construal of itself and itself in relation to others. Actions, like words, can be true or untrue. That is, triadic creatures can live authentically or inauthentically. Triadic creatures are capable of, of a true search for understanding and of authentic speech, but they can also degenerate into idle curiosity and gossip. The relationships between triadic creatures, that is, relations between persons, mediated by these words and actions, can deteriorate from the truly interpersonal I-thou into the depersonalized and exploitative, I-it. This is how Walker Percy is able to link Percy's scientific discovery of the triadicity of the sign with the thought of his, that is, Walker Percy's, beloved existentialist writers, from Sartre to Heidegger to Martin Buber to Gabriel Marcel. And so we return at last to the sciences, and the radical incoherence of our modern scientific view of the world and the creature in it called man, trapped as we still are in the ancient dualism, with our theory of the cosmos, including the human organism, as dyadic mechanism, alongside our formal sciences of logic and linguistics and our sciences of man as psyche and creator of culture. What is fascinating about the fateful rift is that it persists for everybody, including those who would most wish to have nothing to do with it. To embrace pure mechanism, a monism of dyadic events, including a purely behavioristic psychology, is, after all, not to revise Cartesian dualism in any way, but merely to select the preferred half of it as the really real, and to regard the unpreferred half as epiphenomenal or downright illusory. Even in non-behavioristic mental disciplines, in which recognition of the triad ought to be front and center, one frequently finds dyadic principles in charge by default, in the application of mechanical, efficient causal models to mental phenomena, a sort of physics of mental entities, beginning with the Freudian model of contending forces within the psyche. 
Without denying the value that may emerge from such modeling approaches, they must, as Percy says, be understood as transpositions of dyadic theory into the realm of the psyche with no account of how it got there, unquote. Though I must interject that such transpositions of pure secondness are not new. If we go back to our old friend Descartes, we will look in vain for anything like triad triadicity in his philosophy of mind or of matter, despite the fact that during Descartes' own lifetime, on the Iberian Peninsula, John Poinceau was hard at work elaborating a semiotics based on the sign as triadic relation. No, the Cartesian mind is like a container, or a room, within which ideas of all sorts hover before the view of the Cartesian ego. Descartes makes continual use of these spatial metaphors in his theory of the life of the mind. And this is the man who claimed that the nature of mind is better known than that of the body, whose nature is extension. At any rate, if we were to query Descartes concerning the relation itself of the Cartesian ego-knower to the idea that it knows, I think whatever response he gave would only confirm that relation as a dyadic one. And for him, beyond any need for explanation, like is known by like, it would seem. The mind naturally knows the idea that it itself brings forth. What is there to explain? Or might this be another one of those Cartesian inexplicables we are asked to accept as part of the price of dualistic simplification? What of the crucial datum of language itself? Language that is as a natural phenomenon and not merely a formal structure in which mind and matter seem wedded up. What is made of the phenomenon of language within the current scientific paradigm? The evolutionary advantages of a linguistic capacity may be taken to be obvious, but when that capacity is exercised, what is thought to be happening? What is thought to happen when a human infant transitions from a little organism qualified by needs and drives to a little speaking creature that says, Cat? What about it? I will leave you to reread Percy's discussion on pages 284 to 285 of brain structures involved in the association of word sounds with object sensations and Richard Leakey's ruminations on the angular gyrus. Given the work we have been doing, the moral of the story is not hard to grasp. Either triadicity gets somehow smuggled into the discussion unawares or not. If so, you get the angular gyrus behaving like a little triadic homunculus. If not, you lose track of the phenomenon altogether and end up using triadic language to talk not about the phenomenon of language, but about the dyadic operations of a brain machine. In sum, the conscious or unconscious insistence in current scientific practice that all phenomena be conformed to dyadic principles reflects the decay path of a 350-year-old dualism, a theoretical lens that makes a coherent theory of the human being impossible in principle, since it cannot even bring into proper focus the most conspicuous, properly human phenomenon. Accordingly, says Percy, like Charles Peirce, I insist on the qualitative and irreducible difference between dyadic and triadic phenomena. What is important about the triadic event, he writes, is that it is there for all to see. That in fact it occurs hundreds of times daily, whenever we talk or listen to somebody talking. That its elements are open to inspection to everyone, including natural scientists and that it cannot be reduced to a complexus of dyadic events. Nor, he adds, can it be ignored, as such traditional notions as mind, soul, and ideas have been ignored. Once it is brought into focus, Peirce's triad, being open to inspection to anyone, including natural scientists, and being irreducible to transactions of matter and energy, opens the way to an enlarged paradigm for natural science. 
At the same time, the Persia Semiotics, the Science of Signs, opens the possibility of reconstruing the relationship between the sciences and the humanities. For the sign, as John Dealey used to define it, is that which is presupposed to every object. Or, as Charles Peirce put it, all thought is in signs. The thought of the scientist, the thought of the philosopher, the artist, the poet, even the novelist. The sentences of art, poetry, and the novel, says Percy, ought to be taken very seriously indeed, since these are the cognitive, scientific, if you will, statements that we have about what it is to be human. The humanities, in a word, are not the minstrels of the age whose only role is to promise R&R to tired technicians and consumers after work. Rather are the humanities the elder brother of the sciences themselves, who sees how the new scientist got his tail in a crack when he takes on the human subject, and who even shows him the shape of a new science. Well, I'd like to conclude this lecture of mine with a bit of criticism and a thought or two of my own. I realize we've been going at this for a while, so I will keep these remaining remarks fairly brief. Hopefully one or two of them may stimulate some discussion in the live Q&A session we will be having. It should be evident from the manner of my presentation that I am in considerable sympathy with Peirce and his line of argument. Uh, Percy, I should say. With Percy and his line of argument. Percy is in many ways dear to me. He cuts an unusual figure. Raised among literary people and yet a man of science, an empiricist, who came full circle to find himself reading the existentialists and Aquinas's Summa Theologica cover to cover while recuperating from tuberculosis in a sanatorium in Saranac Lake, New York, who never ceased to be the man of science he was, but rather left the profession of medicine aside to become a writer of diagnostic novels, as he called them, novels illuminating not organic maladies, but the predicament of the human self, lost in the cosmos that it understands ever more and more, while understanding itself less and less. Perhaps it requires unusual figures of this kind to perturb the system and accelerate the self-correction of the sciences that have been stuck in a Cartesian rut for several centuries. When I speak of criticism, I mean mainly to mark the limits of the thought expressed in this essay. Percy himself does not claim a finished mending of the Cartesian rift. He aims only to show the inadequacy of the current scientific paradigm and then point out a direction. At least that's how I read him. The current paradigm is at its worst when it posits or takes for granted a dyadic reductionism. When the dyadic principles of res extensa, the mechanical universe of pure secondness, are regarded as all-construing, a form of what is commonly called scientism, the self that is doing the construing becomes, as Percy would put it, a leftover of its own theory. As he writes in Lost in the Cosmos, every advance in an objective understanding of the cosmos and its technological control further distances the self from the cosmos precisely in the degree of the advance, so that in the end the self becomes a space-bound ghost, which roams the very cosmos it understands perfectly. In other words, you cannot beat Descartes at his own game. If you reject Descartes' res cogitans because you hate dualism, or you have a non-negotiable allegiance to materialism, but still play by Descartes' rules, you will end up lost in the cosmos. As Percy addresses the reader in his work of that title, you live in a deranged age, more deranged than usual, because despite great scientific and technological advances, man has not the faintest idea of who he is or what he is doing. However, if the cosmos is found anywhere to contain structural elements that are irreducible to a complexus of dyads, then wherever we might go from there, all construing mechanistic outlooks are done for. Percy was confident that, in the long run, Scientists, despite the weight of custom and collective cognitive habit, 
will find themselves reckoning with the reality of thirdness. We must all reckon with it. Those of us who have spent years, more or less, training ourselves as neo-Aristotelians and contemporary Thomists, and that includes, I think, some of my listeners, retrieving the intellectual riches <clears throat> of the long-deprecated scholastics, can perhaps feel a little bit nettled by Percy's references to the abstruse propositions of the scholastics, whose language is now all but incomprehensible to us, unquote. But let us be honest. If we, as modern people raised on scientific and Cartesian principles, have indeed retrieved for ourselves what Aristotle and Aquinas meant, do we remember what it took to get there? With what success have we helped others to get there? Every semester that I teach philosophical anthropology, I look out at 40 or so bright, shining, 18-year-old Cartesian faces and wonder what success I am having. Let me quote just one short passage from Aquinas, from his Disputed Questions on Truth, Question 2, Article 2. At ideo videmus, quot secundum ordinem immaterialitatis in rebus, secundum hoc in eis natura cognitionis in venitur. Plantae enim, et alia que infra sunt, nihil immaterialiter possunt recipere, et ideo omni cognitione privantur, ut patet secundum de anima. And thus we see that what is of the nature of a cognition is found in things according to the degree of immateriality in them. For plants and those things that are beneath them are able to receive nothing immaterially, and thus they lack all cognition, as the second book of Aristotle's De Anima makes evident. Now, Whatever may be said of the intellectual outlook from which this passage originates, it is not Cartesian. Are we confident that we know exactly what Aquinas means by it? Are we perhaps still en route ourselves? If, as Aquinas argues, each of us has a spiritual soul, how do we distinguish it practically from Descartes' res cogitans? or from the exempted and forgotten self of the scientific materialist. We say that, spiritual though it is, this soul is nonetheless the form of the body. Do we know exactly what we mean by that? What would we say to the empirical scientist who asks, how is this spiritual soul involved with or helping to explain any empirical fact that is of concern to me? For if we are unable to answer a question like that, then, however valid the metaphysics of the spiritual soul may be, it is easy for scientists to have the habit, and they do have such a habit, of ignoring all that sort of talk. It distresses me somewhat, at least, to think of all this, while at the same time observing the degree to which Thomism today resembles a closed shop a circle of people closed in on itself and talking to itself, like a collective version of arrest cogitans, having little discernible cultural impact. In this regard, contemporary Thomists could do much worse than to take Walker Percy, not to mention Charles Peirce, as a model. There is no shame in being still en route. Percy was still en route, his comments about the scholastics and their incomprehensible language are not careless or throwaway comments. He comes at these matters from the other end, for he was a confirmed scientific empiricist before ever he sat and read the Summa Theologica cover to cover. In a letter to Kenneth Kettner in 1987, he said, My method is to start with the Cartesian stance of our natural science, which is well and good as far as it goes, who questions the validity of, quote, mind, studying, quote, matter, for the past 300 years since the scientific revolution in the physical, chemical, astronomical, and biological sciences? And then see how the objective Cartesian method gets into trouble. 
It was only in the last five years of his life that Walker Percy attempted to work through the semiotic of John Poinceau, who Percy thought was, quote, onto something big, but whose language, he complained, was all but impenetrable. Percy, however, also struggled with his hero, Charles Peirce. His published correspondence with Kenneth Kettner, a Peirce scholar at Texas Tech, offers an interesting window on Percy's struggle with Peirce. And if you are interested in following up this aspect of our discussion, I would recommend picking that volume up. In one of his letters to Kettner, Percy describes himself not as not a scholar of Peirce, but a thief of Peirce, which became the title of the volume of letters, edited by Patrick Samway, S.J. What Percy, in his own view, stole from Peirce was the distinction between the categories of secondness and thirdness, seeing correctly the implications of that distinction alone for throwing a wrench into mechanistic reductionism. But merely distinguishing dyadic and triadic events is not enough, and Percy realized it. For if distinguishing secondness and thirdness ends up leading only to a new dualism of dyadic and triadic events as unrelatable phenomena, are we any better off as far as an integral anthropology is concerned? Indeed, as he says to Kettner in one of the letters, does the immaterial third element of the triad, the interpreting agency that Percy in our essay calls the linker or the coupler, merely land us back in Descartes' old dualism? The only progress being that instead of locating the mind in the pineal gland, we can now locate it in the Broadman language area. In other words, are we in any sense overcoming dualism or only displacing it? In my judgment, Percy, unfortunately, never penetrated either Perse or the scholastics quite far enough to achieve a standpoint from which the distinction between secondness and thirdness could be seen against the backdrop of an essential continuity across all existing things. In his hands, that distinction resembles a little too much the dissociative procedure of dualism, which, as Charles Peirce said, performs its analyses with an axe, leaving as the ultimate elements unrelated chunks of being. For Walker Percy, it happened one day, in a cosmos of pure secondness, that thirdness appeared suddenly, like the monolith in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey. For Charles Peirce, thirdness is a fundamental category of being, that can never be completely absent or inactive, though it is indeed subject to degrees of realization. Thirdness is bound up with the purposiveness in nature and evolution itself, of the tendency of form to more form, to more developed form. For the tendency toward greater entropy cannot be the only tendency in a cosmos in which evolution happens at all. For Descartes, none of that is intelligible, since in Cartesianism, nature, in being mathematized, that is to say, substituted by a mathematical model, is quite literally denatured. For Aristotle, the movement of nature, thesis, is for an end. It is teleological. For Descartes, there is no sort of motion that is not assimilable to that which the geometer executes in thought in generating a mathematical line from a point, a line which could just as well be generated in the opposite direction from some other point. Just as with the excluded middle in logic, there is no middle between the point or line actually posited and nothing at all. As Yves Simon puts it, and if you are interested in this, you should pick up his set of lectures published under the title The Great Dialogue of Nature and Space, the objects of pure mathematics are true and can even be beautiful, but they cannot be good. The good is therefore banished from a mathematized cosmos. For the good has the nature of a final cause, which implies a real possibility, what Aristotle would call potentiality, for Peirce, a manifestation of thirdness. In a mathematized cosmos, there is no telos, no end, anywhere, 
There is no real possibility, only endless rearrangement and displacement. In my judgment, let me well, let me suggest anyway, that the conception of nature itself needs to be restored along the lines of a thought that is more ancient than that of Descartes, a thought that Charles Peirce recovered, recast, and developed in modern terms as he recovered and recast scholastic realism. Peirce called this outlook cynicism, the view that reality is continuous. As he wrote, cynicism, even in its less stalwart forms, can never abide dualism properly so called. Cynicism does not wish to exterminate the concept of Tunis, nor can any of these philosophic cranks who preach crusades against this or that fundamental conception find the slightest comfort in this doctrine. But dualism, in its broadest legitimate meaning, as the philosophy which performs its analyses with an axe, leaving as the ultimate elements unrelated chunks of being, this is most hostile to cynicism. In particular, the cynicist will not admit that physical and psychical phenomena are entirely distinct, whether as belonging to different categories of substance, read Descartes, or as entirely separate sides of one shield, but will insist that all phenomena are of one character, though some are more mental and spontaneous, others more material and regular. Still, all alike present that mixture of freedom and constraint, which allows them to be, nay, makes them to be, teleological or purposive, unquote. Scientists are not wrong to love continuity. The problem is that they and their culture are so deeply imbued with a Cartesian outlook, whether they have read a word of Descartes or not, that any departure from dyadic reductionism looks like the introduction of radical discontinuity. Cartesianism triumphs most completely over those who claim to dislike it most. As for Walker Percy, I wish he had lived another 50 years. Thank you for listening. <laughs>